Let's look at adaptation and natural selection. Consider a bird like you might see in your backyard at your bird feeder. When a bird eats a lot of food, should it store this energy as fat? Or should it eat the right amount for its energy level that day? Birds sometimes have to store a lot for flying long distances. But just as this, um, consider a bird that you might see out your window, maybe at a feeder in your backyard. A bird eats what it requires for a given day's energy, but birds facing long migrations may store up much more energy. What is the right amount to eat for a bird in your backyard at this time, the response would be appropriate if the bird were not going far to eat the right amount if it were migrating to eat more. So it depends on the ecological circumstances and also, in this case, food availability, the quality of the environment. You might say, what's the problem with just eating the maximum all the time? Well, for a bird trying to get out of the way of a predator, like a feral cat or pet cat prowling in its backyard, the fatter a bird is, the harder time it will have getting away. So there is a right choice depending on the context. The birds best adapted to their environment will be those that eat the right amount to let them survive and reproduce. And so let's look at that word adaptation. It's both a process and a result. Adaptation's the evolutionary process by which organisms become better suited to their environment. But we also can refer to characteristics that enhance the ability of an individual to succeed in its environment as adaptations. And these adaptations are genetically determined. Natural selection is often described as survival of the fittest. And this is where fitness is equal to reproductive success. In other words, for any individual, the number of its offspring that in turn survive to reproduce. So even though adaptations may be genetically determined, natural selection acts not on the genes, but on the expression of the genes, on the phenotype. To non-scientists, fitness rarely mean survival of the fittest in the evolutionary sense, rather the health and well-being of an organism like a human being with big muscles or able to run fast. So I want you to consider if physical fitness in humans and animals corresponds to evolutionary fitness. And for each group of organisms you consider Think of benefits and costs of achieving, possessing, and maintaining physical fitness on the organism's evolutionary fitness. You've taken genetics, and so you know that the genotype is the unique genetic constitution of an individual. And normally, this is a combination of genes from an organism's mother and its father. The phenotype is the expression of the genotype, morphological, physical, biochemical, etc. And this little clip art shows that although these bugs might look the same, they're sprayed with a pesticide, and certain phenotypes are susceptible, others survive. And so this is those that are more, more fit to existing with pesticides can persist. An orange is sometimes contemplated by Zen Buddhists, and you can look at an orange, appreciate its smell and color and texture, and think from where it came and what it took the tree to make to produce it, and then very mindfully peel 
eat and enjoy each bite of that orange. It could be a process that takes an hour or more. Here in Florida, oranges are really important to our economy, though threatened recently by citrus greening and other diseases over the years. And indeed, oranges that are blemished are not desirable for the consumer at the grocery store, though they still can be used to make orange juice. One of the organisms that damages the appearance of the, organ, of the orange without harming its use for juice too much is the citrus scale. Producers of oranges make a lot more money selling their oranges whole than by selling their juice. And so growers have battled these pests with many chemicals in their arsenal. The citrus scale was initially controlled with cyanide containing pesticides. And for all living organisms, cyanide is potentially deadly. It can disrupt the electron transport chain, it's important for respiration, survival, reproduction. So here is the, in the blow-up picture is a piece of the surface of the orange, the big brown things are adult scale, and the smaller ones are the younger stages of scale. So at, you can imagine as those build up, the orange looks crustier and ickier. So to, to control a population of scale insects depicted in the left circle on the bottom, a population is made up of individuals that are both susceptible and resistant to cyanide. So spraying with the cyanide containing pesticide will kill those that are susceptible. And in the second generation, what happens is you have more, the reproduction by those that are resistant produces a greater proportion of offspring that are resistant. Treating again, the same thing happens. So what any chemical treatment of pests does is selects for resistance. So you know that genes are the information coding for a particular protein these are essential in all biological reactions. These proteins could be enzymes, hormones, or structural proteins. And different forms of the same gene are called alleles. So for organisms that are diploid, every individual has two copies of each gene. In other words, two alleles at the same locus or genetic location. Organisms can be homozygous, having the same allele at a given locus, or heterozygous, with different alleles at one locus or multiple. And these are combinations of genotypes we might find for a very simple organism with two loci, the A locus and the B locus. So in the top line, those four are homozygous at both loci, in the second example, heterozygous, big A, little a, big B, little b is heterozygous at both loci, whereas big A, big A, big B, little b is heterozygous at one locus. Sometimes alleles prevail over, one allele prevails over the other, and we have a case of dominance and recessive. For example, the peas of Gregor Mendel where the green allele was dominant over the yellow allele. The only time you get a yellow pea pod or yellow peas is with the double recessive little g, little g. Both big G, big G, and big G, little g give the green phenotype. But then there could be codominance or incomplete dominance it's sometimes called with flower color. Oh, I have the pea pod covering red, but there could be red flowers and white flowers in certain species of plants where the red flowers are red only if they're double dominant allele and white only if they're double recessive allele and the heterozygotes are an intermediate color, pink. Sometimes the environment can change the appearance of a given genotype. 
That is, it, an organism can have phenotypic plasticity for one or more traits. So if you have two pieces of the same individual that are the same genotype growing in different environments, they can result in two quite different looking individuals. And the capacity to exhibit this plasticity may itself be an evolved trait. And I want you to keep in mind that individuals may show plastic responses as they develop, but also populations over a repeated time, these sorts of responses may be selected and you can get an evolutionary response in the population. An interesting example of this is the grasshopper Gastromargus africanus, which lives in a habitat that's subject to seasonal burning in the dry season. And so individuals that develop in a time the landscape is charcoal colored turn grow up black whereas those that develop during the humid rainy season when the green grass and other plants are growing they turn out green and those that develop in the dry season when the vegetation's turning brown they turn out brown and this is because the pigments laid down at each molt the grasshopper goes through five different instars or developmental stages respond to the quality and intensity of light controlled by hormones. With organisms that we can manipulate pieces of them, it's interesting to look at a given genotype's response to different environments. And the pattern of phenotypes that you see across a range of environments is called a reaction norm. What you find out is that not every genotype is equally flexible over this range of environments. So here is development of a little fly, a drosophila, over different temperatures, at a range of temperatures. How many bristles are on the abdomen is determined in some genotypes by temperature and others not so much or maybe in different directions. So I want you to envision selection on little flowering weeds in a lawn. Some weeds reproduce without sex, and so all of the individuals in a lawn might even be genetically identical. So we could pretend they're not. They're reproducing sexually different genotypes. There may be weeds that genetic, are genetically determined to grow pretty tall. Others of the same species that mature at a very short height. But in a vacant lot where things are unmowed and plants grow in great proliferation, which of these types would prevail and be more fit? And then in a more ma well-maintained place that was mowed once a month, which type would prevail or maybe mowed every two weeks? So a species that's phenotypically plastic may be able to reproduce over a wider range of habitats than one in which height at reproduction is genetically fixed. And this flexibility is especially important for organisms that mature in place. Most plants and certain invertebrates and other organisms have to make do with the situation where it is. So the more plasticity the more likely they are to be able to survive.